Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. A call, call, call. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called call, call, time. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called call, call, call. Welcome to Conversations Across Time, the program that allows us to have conversations with interesting personalities from different time frames. Uh, tonight, we are joined once again. By, pres by former Pennsylvania State Representative and my dear friend and co-host, Babette Josephs. Welcome, Babette. My pleasure. And seated next to Representative Josephs is former Secretary of State, Mr. John Foster Dulles. Good evening. Seated next to Secretary Dulles is Senor Nicolai Machiavelli. Welcome. Thank you. And of course, seated at my far right is the 35th President of the United States and perhaps someone that you, the audience, might not know a lot about. And that is President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Welcome, Mr. President. Thank you. Now, we had a conversation recently, and during that conversation, uh, we were actually asking uh, Mr. Dulles for his understanding of perhaps what led him to be involved in Middle Eastern politics to the extent that uh, there was an overthrow, there was a coup of the democratically elected president of Iran, and that would be Mr. Mossadegh. So I did ask when we last parted, and Mr. Dulles, I hope you've had a week to think about this, do you have, looking at the political situation that exists in Iran today, do you have any regrets in terms of what might have happened had you and your brother not engineered a coup that overthrew the Iranian president? My only regret, Ms. Crawford, is that we did not support more and fully a regime that was on our side, that was an ally, that is, the regime of the, of the Shah. If we had uh, stood behind the Shah and his, and his ministers, the, the situation, the upheavals during that time in 1979, I believe would have cooled, would have cooled down when, they, when the mobs in Tehran accepted the fact that uh, the Shah was there to stay and, would, and we would make sure he stayed there. Now, now let's give, I, I, wanna, I wanna do a little background for perhaps some of our viewers that uh, did not hear our first, the first part of this conversation. And that is that Iran had a democratically elected president. And one of the things that uh, President Mossadegh did when he came into power was to nationalize the oil reserves of Iran. Now, at the time that Mr. Mossadegh did this, the Iranian people were living in sheer poverty. There was a, an elite class, but primarily the people of Iran lived in shanty towns. They were starving. And so when Mr. Mossadegh comes along and says, well, we're gonna nationalize the oil reserves of Iran and throws British petroleum out, why would that be a problem? Because that because Mr. Mossadegh appealed to uh, lower class prejudices and ignorance. Right. And People overthrew and overthrew uh, an, elite, an elite class which was running the, gov the government and the country perfectly well. Running the government into the ground, running the country into the ground. Well, the people were starving. I mean, they got tired of They've been of starving it. for centuries. 
representative. So Joseph they should Davis. be used to it now. You're right. <laughs> In a sense, exactly. Yes, they, right. They, they, it's, that's, that Why give them potatoes that, that if they can have stones? Has been going on for centuries, and it will continue. And it's to, good enough for them, right? I think the, we're all making a, a few distortions right now. The, the fact is that <clears throat> that entire region of the world has a particular set of environmental characteristics that make it not consistent with the Western ideal of stable agriculture that the U.S. has chosen as its, the core of its food source. I would argue with you that the fertile... You would argue that the Middle East is... It's is the Fertile Crescent. Part of it is the Fertile Crescent, but that is an area that exists primarily between two rivers, which in more recent centuries have begun to dry up. And Egypt, Egypt is a huge source of wheat and all kinds of grains. I, I don't deny that there is... There's any, agriculture. There is, I don't me. deny the exist. pardon me. I do not deny the existence the of agriculture. The president wants to speak. And the president always speaks last. <laughs> the, I do not deny the existence of agriculture. All I'm suggesting is that it's a bit of a distortion to suggest that the, what we in this particular set of geographical circumstances now in the United States, what, what we I, I would consider to be poverty is not poverty to people who have Who are a used legacy to of, it, right. I'm, not, I'm not talking about whether they're accustomed to it. I'm talking about a specific culture, which is small-scale pastoral farming, and the majority of it is they hated, animal herding. They hated the Shah. They well, hated that him. has nothing to do with And now they thought. hate us. It has to but do with us. It doesn't That's matter whether they hate us or not. Of course it matters. Our interests, our interests lie in a stable, supportive government. If you'll and that me, is, yes, what, Why does it matter who hates whoever this us is that you're referring to? The United to? States. Well, who, the well, country. How is that, how All is of that us. relevant? To, how is the esteem in which the rest of the world holds the United States relevant to what the United States does and has to do. Honestly, how, is that, how does that affect the United States? Well, I think it makes it almost impossible for us to protect our own interests because we are looked upon by the rest of the world as evil, as an enemy, as a bully, as a boss, as, some, as, as a country they want to avoid at all costs. As are all powerful nations throughout history. Well, see, Senor no. Machiavelli, what, I, I want to throw something in, and that is, in your treatise, which I am of the position that the Dulles brothers follow as a handbook, you state that it's more practical, it's more important for a prince to be practical than to be morally good. Now, given that, your position has to do more with the prince maintaining power, the, the, so, that, so that power becomes his and ultimate his reward. Neck. And his neck. Yes. Now, I just look at it, and, and I, I had the question about how that's, that information and that way of thinking is applied to the situation in the Middle East as it exists today. I tend to think, and, and President Eisenhower, I'd like to hear from you, if you believe that, in fact, what happened in Iran in 1953 has possibly led us to where we are today with the Middle East conflict, with the idea that Iran might become nuclear. Well, number one, the Middle East is composed of many, many, many different factors. Yes. And factions. And they don't talk to each other, so why should they talk to us? They're all looking for the same thing, money and power. It doesn't matter who's in office, they, automa they automatically, the population automatically hates them. And you're going to see overthrow after overthrow after overthrow. They can't get their act together any more than we, we can get, get ours our together. together. And he <laughs> wrote the book on it. The Middle East and is not all that different from how the entire rest of the Mediterranean was a few thousand years ago. That's true. There's, there's a culture of, of, of pastoral herding, there's a culture of small-scale farming. And which little is nation states and, and, and small, tribes. And small warring nation states. And, and the only difference now is the scale of the weaponry. 
the but that is a big well, difference. It's a big difference. It's a big, it's a big difference. difference. It's a big difference in terms of what is actually <laughs> possible in t regarding yeah. destruction, but it is it creates no difference at all in the actual culture of the people. That's why. Oh, I don't that's, think that's true. There can no. be you, you, you're you're suggesting that somehow it, it, through the statements that you've made in this beginning part of this conversation and in the previous one, you're suggesting that somehow the United States has a moral authority that could that could displace the culture that has existed in no, no, the no, Middle no, East. No, 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 no. That's the suggestion. That's not. We could be a leader no. instead of a whipping I, boy. No, no question. That's not correct. Who could be a leader instead of a The country. We, we have Here's a problem the, leading ourselves, let alone the rest of the world. Heaven's and lose, yes. We, the situation is that it's going to continue, continue, continue. Nothing that we do or say as a government today will change anything in the world because they all have their own set of values, they, they have their own idioms, idioms, and they, they have their own analogies, and they don't only well, believe what they want to believe. If you believe that, that then why, well, you didn't you want, want to, to be alive. president, but That's why be is. president? Well, because somebody has to be president, and I didn't choose to be. Right. I was chosen. And believe me, it was the worst job I ever had next to being the commanding general of Europe, because the supreme commander, because in that job, much like the same job, I'm leading, I was sending people to their death. And I didn't enjoy that for one minute. But when you were a commander, people probably weren't working behind your back and around you as you described in the oh, earlier yes, they conversations. Were. Someone's had, always oh, yes. behind a well, general. You, always, you had to go no further than General Alexander Montgomery and ultimately Churchill. Yes. So those are the people who are our allies who were working against me. They handicapped me in every way but they were possible. Not, but they were not within your chain of command. That, I think. I, I excuse think, me. Yes, they were because we were defending them as well as ourselves. We didn't belong in England except for them, not for ourselves. I understand, but but, but as oh, you as we the were supreme commander of the, of, the, of, the, of the Allied forces, it just seems to me that it would. It was somewhat different to have the Dulles brothers working behind your back than to have someone who was un in the military chain of command under you working behind your back. I, 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 I think that these guys were just, the, in fact, one of the things that, that bothers me is that Mr. Dulles, your, your, your brother, became friends with a British agent who was actually a double agent and w turned over information of the entire machinations of the CIA in Europe. There's never been a war without double agents, and there's never been a government without people operating in its shadows. But I, we lost a thousand. We lost a thousand. When Quisling did that, that's, that's, I, it's only a question of degree. That's number one. Yes. But number two is that you have to understand that when we went into Europe, the, uh, my worst enemy at that time, believe it or not, was General Patton. Yes. And now we were classmates and we were good friends, except huh. he was uncontrollable. He didn't take, in, he didn't take directions or instructions or orders. He, was, he became his own supreme commander. Until finally, I took away the one thing that he couldn't get for himself, gasoline and oil. That's why we stopped him. He was going to go right into Berlin and I had made a deal with the Russians that they could be first. Now, Don't ask me why. Now, ma'am, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, I, I, I want you to, when we come back from break, I want you to talk about that because I somehow think that for whatever reason that General Patton may have been his own person and he had his own ideas, he certainly was not in power to the extent that your Secretary of State was in power and couldn't, could not make policy decisions. So we'll come back, we'll take a break. I know, I, I, I know this is, I know you're burning to answer this yeah, question. <laughs> and so when we come yeah, back we'll, we'll from break, I, I, I would love to hear what you have to say. And so we will be back right after this break. Thank you. Conversations across time, conversations across cross time, conversations across time, conversations across time, conversations across time. Conversations Are you so, accusing me of taking advantage? I'm accusing you of raping her. Repeatedly. That's what I'm accusing you of. She had no way to say no. 
Conversations with Carl, Carl, Carl. Conversations with Carl, Carl. Conversations with Carl. <laughs> Waiting for a bus on a street corner when my friend Vivian drives by in a car and says, Babette, I want you. I need you. So I thought, sure. And I had a card with me, my business card. I gave it to her and I thought, I probably won't hear from Vivian again for a while but right away she emailed me she called me and now I'm doing her concept which is really really interesting to make history alive and to relate it to what's happening now in our country and our world and Vivian dragged me into it oh, I can't say I really resisted too hard and that's what I'm now, Mr. President, when we, when we took the break, I presented you with a question regarding the damage that was done by the Dulles Brothers, and I wanted, and you were burning to give me an answer, so please respond. Well, first of all, the blame, at least in the very beginning, was Alan Dulles. He became friendly while he was in London with Kim Philby, who... Kim Philby? Yes, the, okay. the Russian double agent. And he befriended him to the point that he invited him to his home and became his friend in the States and kept pushing him internally to the CIA. And he was giving us some information, most of which we'd already had. And in return, Alan Dulles was giving him the names of the agents in place around the world. And be, he was our agents, our, our, agents. our yes. employees, our agents. and we had thousands of them at the time uh, because it was ordinary people in some cases just giving us bits and pieces that we able to meld together and make a decision. And what he did was we gave him time, place, phone numbers, addresses, identities, and he passed it right straight through to the Russians and the Russians rolled them over. Killed them. They took them all, killed them. And it set the CIA in this country back 100 years. Now, now, Senor Machiavelli seems, seems to, to think me that that's there was evil. no problem with that because there's always, there are always double agents. That's, in a, that's another distortion. I never said there was no problem with it. What I said is that it's not surprising. No, it's so not the surprising. Fact, sorry. The fact is that in any conflict, there are costs. Some of those costs are in people. Some of those costs are physical production, weapons. There's always costs. So it's unfortunate. It's that reprehensible. The costs are so large. Reprehensible is the word. But they're to be expected. Reprehensible is language of morality, which has no there place in go. a discussion of statehood. Well, and we have to understand... No, I'm not sure I agree with that, and I think that's what this discussion is about. And, and we don't agree, that's, and that, that, that's the whole point. We don't agree, while we've well, read your... No, uh, wait a minute, let me uh, finish. While we've read your treatise and we understand what it says, we recognize that people like <clears throat> Secretary Dulles and his brother read your treatise and used it as a handbook 
for that's, running this country. That's, that's what you, you're making a false equivalence. What you're saying is that the choices that the Dulles brothers made were based on a short work that is essentially a manual of statesmanship. Whereas, where in reality, they made their choices to satisfy their own ends. They just used the book as a right, manual right. to accomplish right. their and, own right. goals. And we agree. Those, those I, two things are not the same. Senor Machiavelli, I, I, I'm here to tell you, and I want to say this and, and, and have you understand, because we're talking about the ramifications of acts, and I want you to know that your little treatise, as you refer to it, has been used since it was written by people like Mr. Dulles, Secretary Dulles and his brother. And, and I mean, you look at it and it's sort of like a blueprint that is followed by all people who want to acquire power. And, and, and you're worshiped today, Mr. Machiavelli. That is, you know you. That is, uh, that is false, first off. Senor Machiavelli, you are worshiped by people like John Foster Dulles. Worship. Jesus Christ is worshipped by people who distort his teachings. I'm certainly nowhere near on the moral high ground with which we associate with our Lord and Savior. However, that does not make our Lord and Savior responsible for the cruel acts that people have chosen to in the perpetrate name of in his name. It is, it is what you could be called common sense, the way that power has been exercised from time immemorial. And whoever challenges it, the strength and the power of the prince, as Signor Machiavelli would put it, is, is inevitably put down or else uh, the challenger becomes the prince. I would as, argue that there have been more lives saved by people who were using the principles that I wrote about than there right. have been lives lost because the principles I that I wrote about, can't, Adam, can't Adam agree. please allow me to finish. The principles that I wrote about are principles of expediency and ways to get things done quickly and efficiently. Of course, at times, lives must be taken, but the best way to, to save say, lives is by taking the smallest number and the shortest well, number Well, and that's time. why we dropped two atomic bombs to save people's well, those lives. Well, those were all yellow people, so they weren't important. Well, that's I, right. That's we didn't have atomic bombs until they were invented. If the atomic bombs had existed earlier, they would have been you used, earlier, used just as gunpowder didn't <laughs> exist before. But nations were nations rose and fell Senor at the point of a spear. Excuse you heard me. President, you heard President okay. Eisenhower say that he had regrets of sending people off to their deaths that he knew. It, you seem one you always had, regrets you, sending people to die. You, you and Secretary Donald seem to have no such problems. Right. You have no such issues. Uh, President right. Eisenhower, I just want to say please. one thing. Senior, that you're entitled to your own wrong opinion. I appreciate it. But you that's about it. Because <laughs> through the test of time, there's no question that people have used your treatise as the Bible for political gain. We there's can all agree that that's no a misuse. Question. Fine, it's, but they it's, have. We, we have to put it. The problem we have is that everybody in this room can't control what everybody in that room does. And that's an ongoing thing which will never change and unfortunate for, right, right, for but, the real but world. But in this country, I think we adopted a premise, or at least that's what I was taught in school, that what they're doing in the other room is not our business necessarily, number one. And number two, there's no reason why the people in the other room shouldn't come up with a product or a process that is just as good, maybe better than what we're doing in this room. And you have to believe in a democratic process. You have to believe, I think, that the means are more important than the ends. I, I don't believe that there are any ends, actually. That's I a believe very it's idea. all means. I, I believe, think you're living in a dream world. I believe, I that believe is a very, it's all I, process. I believe that is Only a very, process counts. I believe that is a very idealistic... That's uh, what lawyers think. I believe that's a very idealistic uh, concept, Representative, uh, and that Lawyers bears nothing. And that bears nothing. The force of, of the superior over the inferior oh is is the process. It is the law. That is the law. 
Well, if you have a bigger gun than the law I have, nature. you'll boss me around. That's the law of nature. Uh, the laws, I don't think that's true. And, and don't cavemen. get into animals with me. I mean, animals kill when they're hungry. We kill when we're bored. <laughs> there are plenty that's of very animals good, by the who way. kill like for that. their own entertainment. Mm. Can I and, use that? Yes, And as certainly. for the 100 age, 1,000 agents who allegedly lost their lives, that has gone on also in time immemorial. Yeah, and that's always... That some, yeah, the last one who did it was Rove. Carl Rove tried you, to... Oh, yes, you let's can't, talk about... Yeah, that, no, this is interesting. Because Carl Rove did the self-same thing. Only there and was he, only one agent there was one that agent. we know of. And, and, and of course, we, uh, the, the public, was alarmed by this. Now I so repulsed. It to me I'd like say you can't repulsed. win a chess game without losing some pawns. Oh That's what these agents were pawns. And those one thousand agents were pawns. They and were. How about they the served a function for the United States government. How about the rest of us? All citizens are your, pawns. Your, your brother should have been tried. Your brother should have been tried. He should have been brought up on criminal charges. He should have been shot, as Eisenhower said. That is the how the <laughs> functions of that is the function of government. That is how governments are run. That is how states are run. Did he make a mistake? Do you think it was wrong for him to disclose the identities of those 1,000 agents? I don't know what agent? I don't know what Alan was thinking at the time, and I I believe that Alan's judgments have always been for the benefit of the United States and its government. Your question supposes that Dulles knew that the information he was conveying was being used. He could have figured it out. Come on. Those Mr. Of us president, who were well, president I, at the time. I don't think so. I think other. I believe it, that Alan Dulles, in his infinite wisdom, had the interest of the United States at heart. However, he he committed murder. Yes. And that's and a crime. treason. And that's that's what that's what the problem is. You don't have to go any further than look at the uh, state Wilson who went to uh, Africa right. to see about atom bombs or the makers of atom bombs, and Valerie, his wife, who they, they gave, the government gave up. And she could have been killed. Exactly. By, and it's, and by the way, Rove, uh, just as an Carl aside, Rove. she was our neighbor. Really? Yeah, she went to school with my son. Huh. And I will tell you that that's, you can strike that if you want. Uh, <laughs> The problem we have in this country is that we've lost our way. And it's a, it's a problem that started with me, and I admit it. I was a pawn in the hands of the Dulles brothers. I don't think brothers. it started There's with no you. question, because I, I wasn't well enough to function on a daily basis. And I permitted John to do a lot of the functioning for me and make decisions for me. And that was wrong as we look across time. At the time, though, I was quite ill. And I couldn't, again, I couldn't think clearly. I, I, I was having terrible, terrible, terrible pains. My doctors could not help me. I had a doctor with me 24 7, Dr. Snyder. And I it just, it was something that unfortunately was part of my makeup. And because of that, this country suffered. And President, and President Eisenhower, and because, because of course, as always, we get to interesting topics and, and we're just about out of time, but one of the things that I appreciate is that you admit that, there was, that you made mistakes in entrusting so much of your foreign policy to, to evil people. Yes, well, to, you to, know, Secretary, to, to evil, Secretary Douglas. It, and evil is a relative brother. term. Ms. But, Crawford. But, 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 I, but you, Secretary Dulles, I have to say, it troubles me that you seem to have no regrets. We're looking at, a, we're looking at the Middle East as the source of world problems today. And here we are, left with, you have no regrets. And with that, we will have to say good night and thank you for joining us for Conversations Across Time, where we have interesting conversations with people who have made and shaped the way we live today. Thank you very much. I'm Vivian Crawford. Good night.
Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across.